Okay, folks, let's get started. So I've decided what I'm going to do today is when I finish up the material on this slide, uh, that'll be the material for the exam. So first I'm going to talk about glycogen metabolism, and then I'm going to finish with pentose phosphate. That'll be the, all that we'll have for this exam. If I still have time after that, then I'll talk about new things, but that'll be on the final exam. Okay? So the last of the material will be um, what's on this slide for this exam. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So we're making pretty good headway, getting slogging through this stuff. And um, last time I talked about gluconeogenesis. And hopefully you um, understood that that's very largely a, <coughs> excuse me, a reversal of glycolysis, with the exception of those three enzymes in glycolysis that are replaced by four enzymes in gluconeogenesis. So um, with that exception, they're very, very similar to being the reversal of each other. The main storage that we have in our bodies for glucose is in the form of glycogen. And I've mentioned glycogen to you briefly before. Plants use amylose, and they also use amylopectin, which together we call starch. Okay? And uh, glycogen is related to amylopectin. Amylopectin, you may recall, was a polymer of glucose with alpha-1,4 linkages and it had alpha-1,6 branches, about every 30 to 50 residues. In glycogen, we have exactly the same structure. The only difference is how frequently we see branches. So in glycogen, we have branches about every 10 residues, and those branches are alpha-1,6 uh, bonds that occur there. Okay? So, Glycogen, you saw a slide like this before. You can see glycogen looks kind of like this guy. Each one of these red guys is an end molecule of glycogen. So there's a, uh, a free end in each case. And I think I mentioned earlier in class how for animals it's very important that the more free ends that they have, the more quickly they can release glucose. Because we're going to see that the enzymes that break down glycogen start at an end and work inwards. So the more ends there are, there's more different things, different enzymes that can start acting on that, and more glucose that can be released quickly. And as I noted before, release of glucose quickly is very important for animals because they have to move quickly. They have to escape. They have to catch something. They have to do all this. So that's the structure of glycogen lends itself very nicely uh, to the needs of animals. The breakdown of glycogen, in fact, all of the metabolism of glycogen is very, very simple. Okay? You're going to like this compared to, to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. The, the, the breakdown and the synthesis of glycogen are very, very simple. The only complexity with glycogen is, is the control by, by which it is made and broken down. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about breakdown of glycogen. Glycogen is broken down primarily in your liver and also in your muscles. That's the two places we have glycogen in our body. It's broken down by action of an enzyme known as glycogen phosphorylase. Yes, that's an important name. Glycogen phosphorylase, P-H-O-S, P-H-O-R-Y-L-A-S-E. Glycogen phosphorylase. Now, the reaction that glycogen phosphorylase catalyzes is shown here on the screen. Notice that what it is using, it starts with glycogen. It's adding to that glycogen a phosphate. And the product of that reaction is a glycogen that's one shorter. That is, it's lost one of its glucose residues. And there's a glucose one phosphate. Now. This type of a reaction is called a phosphorolysis. I'll spell that for you too. P-H-O-S, P-H-O-R, O-L-Y-S-I-S. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that it uses phosphate to break a bond. It uses phosphate to break a bond. 
It turns out, in a, in a second, I'll point out to you why that's important. But I want to compare that to a hydrolysis. Okay, A hydrolysis reaction uses water to break a bond. You saw an example of a hydrolysis reaction when we saw proteases. Proteases use water to break peptide bonds. right? A phosphorolysis is using a phosphate to break a bond between adjacent sugar residues. Now, the product of this is what the cell is going to use, which is this glucose 1-phosphate. All right? I'm going to show you a reaction in a second where glucose 1-phosphate is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. Okay? That reaction doesn't take any energy. It's just a matter of moving the, uh, it's actually not moving, it's a mutase reaction so that the glucose ends up being on position 6 instead of being on position 1. Now the significance of that is that if you look at this reaction, we haven't used any ATP. We haven't used any ATP. All we've used is a phosphate. When we did the reaction with glucose and I wanted to put a phosphate on position 6, I had to use ATP, right? I said that glucose 6-phosphate had a higher energy, and to put that phosphate on there required something that had an even higher energy, which was ATP. The question I would ask you here, or I would ask you on an exam, is why does this not need ATP to put this on here? I'm open to suggestions. So glucose 1-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate have essentially the same energies, same high energy. The cell's getting away with murder here. How's it doing it? Stuart? Excellent. Stuart just hit it on the nose, OK? So the alpha-1-4 bonds that are being broken have energy in them. The energy of those bonds is used to put that phosphate onto glucose. So the cell is actually being very efficient. Instead of using an ATP to put that phosphate on there, it's now saved an ATP, basically, by using the energy of the alpha-1-4 bond that it would broke to, to, put, uh, to split off that glucose. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just thinking that this is the same amount of energy. It's not as much energy as an ATP, but it's sufficient energy to get the phosphate on there. Yeah. Yes? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said the first part. Would you use more than one ATP in building a spot in the first place? Very good question. We'll see that it takes about one triphosphate to make that bond. OK, so I'll show you that when we do the synthesis. Very good question, though. OK? All right, so uh, we have glucose 1-phosphate. All right. Now, remember the cell's aim here is it wants to get glucose available as quickly as it possibly can. Well, looky here. Here's a, here's a reaction catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoglucomutase. What did I say about mutases? <coughs> So mutase is going to have an intermediate that's got two phosphates on it, right? So it's going to have a glucose 1,6-bisphosphate as an intermediate, and then it's going to clip off that phosphate that's on number one and leave everything with a glucose 6-phosphate. Okay? The parallel reaction we talked about was we went from 3PG to 2PG. We had an intermediate that had 2,3-BPG. We clipped off the phosphate that was on 3, and that left us with a 2PG. Yes, ma'am? Yes, the name of the enzyme is phosphoglucomutase. Let me spell that. OK. All right, so this is a reversible reaction. We'll see this reaction is important if cells want to make glycogen as well. Now, the beauty of this reaction is we've done two steps, and all of a sudden, we've got an intermediate in glycolysis. Bang, bang, the cell immediately is making energy. OK? So glycogen is providing the cell a very nice way of getting glucose available very, very quickly. And it's for this reason that your muscles store glycogen. They store it because 
almost instantaneously, they can start releasing glucose as they need it. Okay? Very, very useful thing. There's only one more reaction we have to think about in breaking down glycogen, and I'll show you that one. It may not seem obvious at first. The reaction that we need to think about is dealing with branches. Glycogen phosphorylase doesn't like branches. It doesn't like them so much that it will get to within four residues of a branch and it will stop. So when glycogen phosphorylase is getting close to that branch, it just says, uh-uh, I'm out of here. It won't touch it any further. If the cell didn't have a way of dealing with that branch, then the glycogen would only get to a certain shortness and then it wouldn't get any shorter. Well, that wouldn't be of much use if the cell is wanting the, the glucose that's in that glycogen. So the cell has another enzyme that has a mouthful of a name. It's about this long. And we call it debranching enzyme. And you can call it debranching enzyme. What debranching enzyme does is what's shown on this slide right here. It's an odd pair of reactions that this enzyme catalyzes. There's two reactions catalyzed by the same enzyme. The first reaction clips the alpha-1-4 bond right there where my green pointer is, it clips that alpha-1-4 bond and it moves these three guys out to the end. So you see the three guys have been moved out to the end. We've broken alpha-1-4 bond here. We recreated the alpha-1-4 bond here. Didn't take any energy to do that. Those two bonds, that, that, that bond has the same energy in either case. That leaves behind, if we didn't do something about it, this guy right here, this alpha-1-6 bond. The alpha-1-6 bond is the other activity of the enzyme. It clips it right there, and it uses water. Why does it use water? Any guesses? Well, it's doing hydrolysis, but my question is, why isn't it using phosphate? It used phosphate when it clipped the other bond. What was the key? Why was, it using, why was it able to use phosphate with the other bond? There was enough energy, right? This would make you think that there's not as much energy in an alpha-1-6 bond, and therefore, the cell can't use phosphate. So its only hope is using water to split that off. And that's exactly the case. There's not as much energy in an alpha-1-6 bond as there is in an alpha-1-4 bond. This guy releases free glucose. And a little trivia answer is this is the only reaction in the uh, breakdown of glycogen where free glucose is released. Because glycogen phosphorolysis, you recall, releases glucose 1-phosphate. It doesn't release free glucose. This is the only reaction that releases free glucose. All right. Well, you've just broken down glycogen. Using the enzymes I've just described to you, three enzymes, you can completely break down glycogen and put all the intermediates into glycolysis like that. Okay, Very simple set of pathways, or very simple pathway. So now you can see how the <clears throat> metabolism of glycogen ties in directly to the metabolism of glucose. The two pathways are linked. We've now just gone from Portland up to, say, Tacoma on I-5. We've extended our highway, right? Okay. Questions on this before I move forwards? That's all there is to break down. Yes, sir. You said the uh, branching did both? It does both of these, both the moving and the clipping of that bond. Yeah. Two very unrelated reactions. One enzyme. Yes, sir. So the three enzymes were glycogen plus four legs, plus The three enzymes are exactly as you stated. They are glycogen phosphorylase phosphoglucomutase, and debranching enzyme.